Lord, we now lift you up this morning and lift up your word. We ask God that you'd open our hearts to receive what you have for us today. Touch my lips, Lord, to speak your word. Bless us, Lord, I pray. Touch our hearts in a special way. In your wonderful name, amen. The message today is false identity. A lot of people walking around today with a false identity. They're not who they say they are. They're pretending. Pulling the wool over people's eyes, making them think they're something they're not. We're going to look at that. The false identity we're looking at today is what I call casino. A Christian in name only. Some of you probably heard the, talk, the, the term rhino when they speak of politicians, the Republican in name only. Well, this is a Christian in name only. A lot of people are going around today claiming to be Christians, and are they really Christians? They're Christians in name only. Matthew 15, 8 9 says, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching us doctrines and commandments of men. There's a quote out of Isaiah. And it rings so true today. There's so many that are, they honor God with their lips. And they draw near with their mouth, but their hearts are far from him. Luke 6, 46 says, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? So many people call Jesus Lord, but they don't do the things He says. They're not truly Christian. You're not truly a Christian unless you are doing the things that He says. That's what we're going to look at today. John 14, 21 says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is He who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So he says those that keep his commandments and do them. So many people are rejecting the commandments of God. They're twisting them and changing them, making them what they want them to be. We have fallen into the church. We've gotten caught up in all this political correctness that don't dare talk about certain things. Let's change sin into something it's not. Let's change it into a disease or a, or a lifestyle or something else. But the Bible clearly says it's sin. And it's getting worse and worse. I read articles every day of what's happening in our nation and it's just, it just seems to be happening. The church is standing by silently. Let it, let it go on. But church, we can't be silent if we're truly Christians. We've got to stand up for what God's Word says. There's an article about in some of the universities where they're kicking out the Christian clubs because they refuse to choose leadership unless that leadership believes in the Bible. They say you can't do that. You can't have conditions on the leadership of your club. You have to choose your leadership from anybody. You know, this whole idea of diversity and political correctness. How can you have a Christian club if you choose a leader that's a Satanist? Or an atheist? But the cause is saying, unless you're open to doing that, you can't have a club on campus. So they're, fighting, they're trying to fight back. But that's how ridiculous it's getting in America. Christianity is becoming more and more illegal in this country. It's being shut down. Last week, Mark read a poem by a judge who was kicked out of his courtroom. They stripped him of his judgeship because he refused to take the Ten Commandments down. There's nothing in our Constitution that says you can't do that, that you can't have the Ten Commandments hanging in a courtroom. <clears throat> but they've twisted history and what, what the... Constitution says, you know what, the church just stands by, oh, okay. Separation of church and state, okay, we'll keep inside our room. We'll close our doors, we won't bother anybody. We won't go out in public. That's not true Christianity. It's not what the apostles did. They spoke openly, out in the streets, facing their own death. All of them martyred, except for John. 
the only one that died of old age. Beheaded, skinned alive, boiled in oil, crucified. Some of the ways they were put to death. Horrible deaths. But you know what? It didn't stop them. They went out in public and proclaimed the gospel. But today, if somebody calls us a name, oh, we're going to hide. Well, they say I'm a religious fanatic. I go out and stand up against these things. They're trying to shut down Christians. And we can't let them do it. We can't be Christians in name only. Dave Wells from World Net Daily in an article said, one of the most massive and widespread occurrences of identity theft has happened. And it is not even attracting the attention of local, state, or national leaders. This particular insidious method targets a minority group, stealing their most precious possession, and yet even more compelling is that the perpetrator assumes nearly permanent residency in the victim's identity. The mastermind behind this worldwide ring has cells in every city and town in America, including operatives in many unsuspecting homes. The evidence of this outrage is right before our eyes, but we have simply chosen to ignore its existence, pretending that the consequences will be insignificant. The victim is biblical Christianity, and the operatives of this fraud are millions of Americans, both clergy and laity, who are walking around using that identity with no right to do so. The consequences are a nation without the spiritual, moral, social, and political anchor that held us firm through over 400 years of tempests and storms. Many will insist that we have the right to practice Christianity as our own conscience dictates. We have, it says wrong, we don't have the privilege to practice Christianity as our own conscience dictates. We're to practice Christianity the way God has written it down in His Word. So he says, wrong. We have the privilege of living out a faith based on absolute truth as given to us by the author and finisher of that faith without error or omission in His written Word. If we want to invent our own religion, we are free to do so, free to reap the consequences and free to call it anything we want but Christianity. People want to go out and invent their own religion, they can call it something else. But if they want to call it Christianity, they need to understand what Christianity is. A true Christian is identified by the fruit they bear. So the Bible tells us, how do you identify who is a true Christian? Matthew 7, 20-23 says, Yes, the way to identify a tree or a person is by the kind of fruit produced. Not all who sound religious, are really godly people. They may refer to me as Lord, but still won't get to heaven. For the decisive question is whether they obey my Father in heaven. At the judgment, many will tell me, Lord, Lord, we told others about you and used your name to cast out demons and to do many great miracles. But I will reply, you have never been mine. Go away, for your deeds are evil. That's Matthew 7, 23-23 out of the Living Bible. But we identify a person by the fruit they produce, not by what just comes out of their mouth. Different kinds of fruit represent different kinds of false identities. One of those fake fruits is the half-hearted Christian. Revelation 3, 15-16 says, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot, I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now the idea there in Revelation is you're not what you're supposed to be. This church of Laodicea, it sat between Heropolis and Colossae. One was known for its cold springs, refreshing springs. The other was known for its hot therapeutic pools where people would go for healing. But they sat in the middle, and their water was lukewarm. And it said it was only good for one thing, to induce vomiting. They had a terrible water supply. But what Jesus was telling that church is, you need to be what you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be refreshing or therapeutic, but you're not supposed to be lukewarm, which you do nothing but make people vomit. But he said, I will vomit you out of my mouth. But that's what the church is becoming today. It's becoming a lukewarm church. It's fake fruit. It's 
not standing up for the Word of God. One of the problems is what we call hypocrites. I mean, I always see that that's one reason a lot of people say they won't go to church full of hypocrites. Well, the world is full of hypocrites. What is a hypocrite? Matthew 15, 79 says, You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. People who honor God with their lips, but their hearts are not with them, are hypocrites. For in vain they for in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Are we teaching the traditions and precepts of men, or are we teaching God's Word? See, hypocrites comes from Hippocrates in the Greek, which is an actor under an assumed character. That's what a hypocrite is. A hypocrite is an actor. You could call a stage actor a hypocrite, and you'd be correct, because they're acting in the role of a hypocrite. It's acting like you're something you're not. There are people going around acting like they're Christians and they're not. You ask them, they say, yes, I'm a Christian. Where do you attend church? Oh, I don't go to church. I don't have to go to church. Oh, organized religion is bad. I don't want to be part of that. I worship God in my own home. You hear all that stuff? They're just a hypocrite. Because if they truly were a Christian, they would want to be around other Christians. That's my desire. Once things start getting rough at home, I can't wait to be with you. That's what gets me up on Sunday morning. That's what gets me here on Wednesday night. I want to be with brothers and sisters in the Lord. Because you know what? That's what gives me the strength to make it through the week. Because the world's not giving me any strength. But you give me strength. You're my brothers and sisters in Christ. But people that don't want anything to do with the church but claim to be Christian, I, you know, I have to wonder about that. But today, so many people think Christianity is what they post on Facebook. They won't dare go to church, but well, they'll put their little scripture verses up there. and look, look at me. Look at my Facebook page. I'm a Christian. Where do you fellowship? I don't have to. I, I read scripture verses on Facebook. Where is that in God's Word? It says, forsake not the assembling of yourself one with another. You need to remember that when people say, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to be part of a fellowship. That's opposite of what the Scripture says we're to do. How else do you build each other up? That's the purpose of assembling together, to build each other up. Then there's strange fruits. There's a lot of strange fruits out there. They're the cults. And false religions. 2 Timothy 4, 2-4 says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their eyes away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. People today have itching ears. They look for somebody that will tell them what they want to hear. Wait a second, I didn't like what you preached last week. I was in God's Word, but I didn't like it. I can go find somebody that will tell me different. So I'm going to go find somebody to tell me different because I didn't like that. It didn't feel good. Well, if you hear something from God's Word or you read something from God's Word that doesn't feel good, pay attention. He's trying to say something to you. Maybe there's an area of your life that He's putting His finger on you need to change. But it's a lot easier just to go find somebody else to tell you that it means just the opposite. But see, that's what we're doing in our world today. We're twisting God's Word around. And look how far we've come in America in such a short amount of time. We have completely destroyed family and, and marriage, the meaning of it in America. Nobody knows what it means anymore. We have a Young girls, our neighbor, comes and cleans our pastures. And she's distraught because in school, the stuff they're teaching her. And she's a good young Christian girl. And she said, I can't stand it. All this transgender and pushing it on us and homosexuality and, and this is part of their sex education. They're teaching them how to, you know, be these other things. And she knows it's not right, but she doesn't know what to do. Because she's being bombarded with it every day. That's it in our schools. You know what? 
They didn't teach me that when I was in school. But see, now they're focusing on that more than regular monogamous heterosexual sex. That's not what they're teaching anymore. They're teaching that it's whatever you want. Anything goes. We're going down a path in America that's just going to destroy this country. If you go back in history and you look at the great civilizations, what destroyed them is when they lost their moral compass and started allowing any, everything. That's what destroyed them. That's what's going to destroy America. And there's a reason behind it. We were watching something last night and learned some things I didn't really know. And it was talking about all the great cultures in history. All of them had goddess worship. And the in the temples where they worship the different goddesses, Diana and Astarte and the different ones you read about in the Bible, the different goddesses that the priests had to be castrated because the goddess had to have superiority over them. They exalted the woman above the man to the point they had to be castrated. And then they, they believed that these goddesses could change a person from being a man to a woman or a woman into a man. What does that sound like? That's what we're beginning to do in America. We're beginning to worship the goddess. All this stuff that we see is exalting the woman above the man is not, is not what the Bible teaches. What period is it? Well, throughout history, go way back to, to the Samaria and all the way through the Greeks and the Romans. All the great cultures in history fell into goddess worship. And they still worship the goddess. When people that worship nature, they're worshiping Gaia, which is a goddess. It's goddess worship. And exalting the woman above the man. That's opposite of what God says. Men and women are equal in God's eyes, but we have roles that are different. That's what God is talking about. Men are not to lord themselves over women. But Paul made it very careful to set it straight in Corinth because it was a city in which there was a lot of goddess worship. So he said, women be silent in church. Don't teach the men. The men are to teach you. And the reason was for that was to combat against his goddess worship in the church. But it's taking over in America and the church is letting it. I'm going along with it. I got really upset because I saw a conference and it's called for women. I think that's really good when they have conferences for women. But they chose to me a title that just rubbed me the wrong way. It's a sisterhood conference. Well, that whole term sisterhood is this women don't need men. We're stronger than men. Let's get together. That's, that's what you think of when you hear this whole sisterhood thing. It's like, don't, don't pick a worldly title. Call it the women of God. Or, you know, you can find some other term, but it just seems we're so, we want to be correct and we want to attract the world. You know, that's really not the church's job. Nowhere in Scripture to say the purpose of the church is to attract the world into the church. Now, you'll hear this from me over and over. The church is a place for Christians. We invite people in in hopes that they will get saved. Not that they will change who we are, but we will see them change and become more like Christ, just like we're endeavoring to do. That's the purpose of the church. We shouldn't try to get... More and more, you know, kind of like the world, but we're really not like the world. We don't want to think we are, so they'll come in. When we do that, we just invite all kinds of trouble into the church. It's like, I don't like this church. I can look down and know every one of you. And I know if there's some strange fruit in the church. I don't see any strange fruit. That's good. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parent, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Talking about people that have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of God. And this whole list, we read that, and you can just it's like watching the evening news. We see all that. 
Sometimes you have to turn on something else so that we get that out of our brains. I mean, get overwhelmed by the news sometimes. Oh, yeah. We don't watch it for that. Turn on a Hallmark movie. At least they're still pretty decent. Turn on something else. Somebody asked me, like, why do you like watching these Hallmark movies? It's because I get so tired of the garbage in the world. So far, they haven't really compromised. They're not throwing a lot of stuff at me in those movies. They're pretty predictable. And I know I'm, you know, I know that somewhere there's going to be a horse in the movie. You know, at least the older ones, the newer ones, are, they've gone with a different formula. You know that somehow the, the girl with the wrong guy is going to get the right guy. And they're never going to have a scene where the shows them in bed together. You know, they're, they're safe. There's at least one or two interrupted kisses. We have this checklist. We try. We check off as we watch them. You know, there it is. And if it's a winter movie, there's a snowball fight. If it's not a winter movie, there's a chance that it's going to be a food fight. We like, just, grit. we like grit also. And we like the old westerns. Yeah, there's, so there, there's better things than watching the news all the time. <laughs> Got to keep up on what's going on in the world so we know what we're praying for. But boy, it can really get you down after. 2 Timothy 3, 6 7. For this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loading, loaded down with sins, led away by various loves, all, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's funny, in this scripture next to it, in my older Bible, I wrote Oprah. She's one that came into the homes, captivating gullible women and loading them down with sins. Leading, leading them away. A lot of people told me, oh, Oprah's a Christian. No, Oprah's a New Ager. She is not a Christian. You watch the people she brings on her show and you listen to what she does not believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. But she's led a lot of people astray and into these books that she promotes that are New Age. But she's not the only one. There are many that creep into our homes. How are they creeping into our homes? That box that we put in our home. We turn on all the time. That's why we got to be careful what we watch. And when you're hearing something that doesn't sound right, spend some time in God's Word. Filter it. You know, I like watching the History Channel, but I filter stuff that I hear to God's Word. I'll watch science programs, but I'll filter what they're saying to God's Word. Because we need to filter it. Because we're being bombarded with stuff that's not true. Because we want to know the Bible. If you know the Bible, you know the truth. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So that tells me, from cover to cover, this was given by inspiration of God. It doesn't say some of the Scripture. It says all Scripture. Old and new. Because when this was written, all they had was the old, they called it Tanakh. We call it the Old Testament. And then we added the canon of the New Testament to it. God's Word. It says it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's a manual. You want to be fully equipped? Get the manual out. Read the manual. Men, it's okay to read the manual sometimes. It's all in here. I know men are usually terrible at reading instructions, but I've learned to be better at reading instructions because I hate it when I put something together, you get something, you put it together, you got left, parts left over. There's something wrong, you want to know, did, did they give me extras or did I forget to put something somewhere? Is it going to fall apart? Especially if you're putting together a, a, a toy for your children, a bicycle or something, you don't want extra parts. <laughs> Testing and send them down the road. <laughs> Something will fall off. Read the instructions, just like in life. Read the instructions. It's all in there. I learned that um, just recently. I decided to do the brakes on my car. The first side took me over an hour to change the brakes. And then I had to read online instructions. I found out there was a shortcut. Second side 
took half the time. And I found out why the one thing that was really, you know, seemed like, why did they make it like this? This makes it difficult to do. Well, there was an answer. <laughs> Read the instructions. I need to get a manual for my car before I work on it again. I don't have one. And it cost me an extra half an hour. Amazing thing is you can go online and you can get instructions. <coughs> Helped. Zenos, a Christian in name only, will be left behind when Jesus returns. In Matthew 25, 1 through 13, is the story of the ten maidens, the ten virgins. What's interesting about these ten virgins is they all know that the groom is coming. The groom is Jesus. They all know Jesus is coming. They're all waiting for the groom. But half of them were prepared, the other half weren't. And there was one half, they didn't bring enough oil for their lamps. They would represent people who the light is beginning to go out in their life. And they're not living the way they should be living. The others that had plenty of oil, oil in the scripture usually represents the Holy Spirit. Their life was continuing to shine. They had plenty of oil to keep their light going. The five didn't have to go off looking for oil. Just like many in the church go off looking for some other teaching. And while they were gone, the groom arrived. And the wise ones led him into the wedding feast. You see, back in that day when they had a wedding, it was all about the groom. It's hard to believe because today it's all about the bride. It's the bride's special day. Everything focuses on the bride. They just want to make sure the groom shows up in his clean tuxedo. Back then it was the opposite. The bride wasn't involved in any of the wedding ceremonies until the wedding, the actual wedding, you know, when they had the actual wedding ceremony, but everything else was about the groom. And they would lead him in, usually his friends would carry him in into the feast. And there would be young ladies that would lead his way in with lamps. They would lead him with light into the, into the feast where the bride would be waiting for him. And these were prepared. Those represent us. We are the bride of Christ. We are those that are waiting for him. And this represents believers that are waiting for his arrival. And when the groom arrived, some were left out because they weren't prepared. Another thing is wearing a cross does not make you a Christian. And a lot of people say, oh, that person wears a cross. He must be a Christian. Well, not necessarily. Ozzy Osbourne wears a cross. He's definitely not a Christian. Rihanna wears lots of crosses in that picture. She's not a Christian. Madonna wears a cross. You know why she wears a cross? She was asked in an interview one time. She says, because it has a naked man on it. How much more blasphemous can you get than that? But people go, oh, she wears a cross. She must be a Christian. Katy Perry wore a dress covered with crosses. Oh, she was once a Christian. And she seems to be going through this period in her life, if you ever interview things with her, that she is in real conflict in her life. Her parents are Pentecostal preachers. She walked away because she, her, her music career in Christian music wasn't going anywhere. So she created this new identity and went secular and took off. Made a lot of money, but there's an emptiness. You can tell there's an emptiness. There's an identity crisis in her life. She's completely changed her look because she doesn't want to look like what people know of Katy Perry. She's changed her appearance. But she's not a Christian just because she wears crosses. You wear a cross, that's not a bad thing. But it should mean something. Not just a symbol. See, putting a symbol on doesn't make you a Christian. Putting a fish on your car doesn't make you a Christian if there's no meaning behind it. But if it has meaning and you're ready to tell somebody what it means, that's a good thing. You wear a cross and somebody says, oh, I know you wear a cross. How come? Wow! Wide open door to witness to them. Because Jesus Christ is my Savior. And I am saved and I'm going to heaven because of what he did on the cross. See, it's wide open door. That's why you should wear one. Not because it's a fashion statement. The Bible defines a true Christian as one who has personally received Jesus Christ as Savior. 
who trusts in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone for forgiveness of sins, who has the Holy Spirit residing within, and whose life evidences change consistent with faith in Jesus. Does your life have the evidence of change that's consistent with faith in Jesus? Are you bearing the fruit that people look at your life and say something's different about that person? They seem to handle situations differently than other people. Are you a person that's ready to offer prayer to somebody in need? And that's something we as Christians should do. It's amazing how many people will let you pray for them. They may not have any relationship with God at all, but they seem to know that somehow that prayer is a good thing. And it's a great open door when somebody is going through a struggle that's your neighbor or somebody, even somebody you run across and you're in a conversation with you all I'm going through this terrible time and say, can I pray for you? And I'll tell you that 90% will say yes. And pray for them. You know, prayer doesn't need to be a difficult thing. It's just talking to God. We don't have to impress God with our words. Just talk to Him like you talk to a friend. Somebody says, I'm struggling with cancer. You just pray, God, this individual has cancer. And we know that you can heal it. And we know that you can bring them through this. So God asks you to do that. See, it's very simple. It's just talking to them. You don't have to say thee and thou. And speak King James English. Just talk to God in your way you talk to anybody else. It's all prayer is. Acts 11, 25-26 says, Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. When he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. You know, that's where we first see the name Christian, where believers were first called Christians. What does that mean? Why were they called Christians? Christian comes from Christianos in the Greek, which means to belong to Christ. And it said it means um, be Christ-like, and I found that's really not the meaning of Christianos. When you would add, take Christ and add that ending on it, that means that you belong to that person in the Greek. That's what the word means. You're a slave of Christ. Christian means you belong to Christ. You are his. You are his slave. You, you are his bondservant. A bondservant is a slave by choice. That you choose to serve that person. That's what being a Christian means. That's what the word Christian means. 1 John 2, 4-6. through The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So it means to be a Christian. We should be trying to walk in the same manner that Jesus walked. Are you going to be perfect at it? No, it takes time. We were learning that and studying Colossians and Philippians and Paul talking about how we are trying to attain these things. Even Paul said, I have not yet reached this goal, but I'm pushing forward to this goal. So I want you to understand, it doesn't mean because you occasionally mess up that you're not a Christian. But you get right back up and try to get back on track to be Christ-like. That's what a Christian does. He doesn't just change the rules because he doesn't like them. Well, I don't like what God says. I don't like what He commands, so I'm going to change it. I'm going to ignore those commandments. Oh, we're not under the law anymore. That's a favorite one. We're under grace, so we can kind of do what we want. No, the law is there to tell us what sin is. What it means by not being under the law is you don't have to sacrifice animals for your sins. You are no longer under the law to gain righteousness. So when you sin... You don't have to go get your favorite pet and offer it up to God. Because that's not going to take care of your sin. That's what means not being under the law. Your sin has already been taken care of. The Bible tells us that 
All you have to do is confess your sins to Him and He is faithful and just to forgive you because the price has already been paid. That's what it means not being under the law. No longer do we have to do all that ritual to get to God. We are the temple now of the Holy Spirit. So don't can't be reading though he tells you that you are going to be absolutely perfect and do everything right. No, you're not. You're going to make mistakes. You walk out of this room and make a mistake. But when you realize you've done that, just turn to God and ask Him to forgive you. And not only does He forgive you, He wipes it completely away. But we should be trying to walk every day as in the manner that Jesus walked. That should be our goal. That's what makes us a Christian. That we want to be His. And we want to be like Him. So a Christian in name only is not a Christian. Calling yourself a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. You can call yourself the greatest football player in America, and that doesn't make you the greatest football player. You can call yourself the greatest actor, doesn't make you the greatest actor. You can call yourself all kinds of things, that, that doesn't make you that. And again, too, sitting in church doesn't make you a Christian. Any more than sitting in your garage makes you a car. It's being belonging to Christ, accepting Him as your Savior, being born again. The Bible tells us. What does that mean, to be born again? It means that we are a new creation, that we've accepted Christ, all the old things in our life are now gone, everything now is new, and we are living for Him. The Bible says if we believe that He was the Son of God, we believe that He died and rose from the dead. We're willing to tell that to other people. Yeah. We will be saved. We will be born again. That's what a true Christian is. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. If there's anybody at all that needs to ask Jesus to come into your life, Whether you're here right now or listening to this message later. You need to accept Christ as your Savior. You say, you know, I think I've just been a Christian in name only. I truly want to have a relationship with Him. That relationship starts by inviting Him into your life. Without anybody looking around, if you want me to pray for you to accept Christ this morning, slip your hand up. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you so much for all that you do for us. Lord, we don't want to walk around with a false identity. We want to be what we say we are. We don't want to be Christians in name only. We want to be what the name Christian means. We want to belong to you. We want to be your bond servant, serving you, Lord. Walking the way that you walked. But we need your help. We thank you, Lord, that you did not leave us alone, but you left us with your Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us to give us strength and the ability to become more like you. Holy Spirit, strengthen us. Watch over us each day. Convict us of our sins. That when we commit them, we'll quickly turn away from them. Jesus, help us to become more like you and to reach the world around us and not let the world affect the way we think, affect the way we serve you. And let your word be life to us. Your word is a living word, Lord. Speak to us through your word. Give us a hunger every day to pick your word up, Lord, and to learn from it. We ask that, Jesus, in your wonderful name. Amen. 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 Well,